Welcome to Shrink Wrap Hawaii. My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in Honolulu. And my guest today is Marissa Miley Katz. And as her name implies, Marissa grew up in Hawaii, attending Enchanted Lake Elementary School in Kailua and the Honolulu Waldorf School, where she learned to incorporate all of the arts into every part of her life. She was nurtured by a mother who is a professional musician, librarian, and teacher, and a father who is an actor and psychotherapist. It gives me great joy to welcome Marissa to Shrink Wrap Hawaii today. Welcome aboard, Marissa. Thank you for having me. So, what do you do over there in Medford, Massachusetts, near Boston? Well, I'm a music therapist. I am also working using psychotherapy and I work with individuals anywhere from five years old to five years old and up. Yep. So I'm fascinated by music therapy uh, because I'm told it accesses different parts of the brain and does things that regular talk therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy or psychoanalysts just <laughs> can't do. How does that happen? Um, a good question. I think the easiest way to explain it is probably just that music therapy, you're using music as the tool, which is kind of a s sneaky way of getting people to relax while at the same time be able to express themselves because, you know, we're using a very analytical part of our mind when we're trying to form words and sentences, but when we can use music, we can relax because that's something that we're almost born being able to enjoy and you know move to and we hear our mother's voice as music and so uh -huh. it's, it's much more natural and easy to um, use various parts of the brain. Yeah, it seems yeah. like everywhere around the world um, mothers, fathers sing to their babies. Yeah, yeah. I would say it's a universal language, yeah. So when we've been through some sort of a crisis or trauma, yeah. music must be another way in? It definitely is. There's parts of the brain that we can't access when we go through a trauma, and so sometimes. And so music being actually in every part of our brain, they've been able to find parts where our brain is being stimulated all over when we're listening to music <clears throat> um, or when we're using music um, so that if there's any part of the brain that's kind of damaged we can use or damaged from trauma, damaged from an accident, we can use music as a means towards getting to creating more brain cells and more pathways. Wow. Yeah. So it's just not, it's not like eyesight or hearing where it's localized to one spot. It's, mm -mm. it's everywhere. It's everywhere, including when we have patients that have Alzheimer's, for example, where there's huge parts of the brain where there's deterioration. The kind of the last part of the brain to go is, I'm, I'm forgetting the name now, but it's the back of the brain. Uh -huh. And basically it's the part where you the have emotional, emotional memory and music for some reason. So we have this ability to experience um, emotional memory while also ac using, accessing it through music. So th a lot of people have found through research and also documentaries now showing that you can use music with Alzheimer's patients to have quality, better quality of life and have them feel like there is a real person inside of them, inside them. Yeah. Have you ever had work where you got to use that? I did. I got to use it in hospice in my first year internship. Tell me a little bit about that hospice experience and music. Sure. Um, so I worked at different nursing facilities and I had a lot of different patients, probably 20, 25 patients. One of the ones that sticks out in my mind, there was a patient who she was pretty much bed bound. She didn't want to get out of bed ever. Um, she had probably had a lot of trauma in her life. She had been homeless a lot of her life. I think she had had drug abuse in her life. Um, so she had what people would sometimes call, it's not a very medical term, but word salad, where she would use mm. 
a lot of words that strung together that didn't random words right but when you used music therapy with her she could get into it she she could understand recognize the melody she could sing with you to the melody and eventually she could start to actually sing words from the actual song so being able to string phrases together that made sense was pretty awesome when she was coming from total isolation not even wanting to interact with people being really just anxious and angry most of the day um, and people not really knowing how to meet her needs and total transformation where she was getting up out of bed and she was going into the congregating with people in the common spaces you saw that happen that's what people were reporting to me when wow. I would when I was continuing to see her yeah that's amazing so it's not just when she's singing it right had carry over to the rest of her life absolutely yeah that is pretty it was pretty astounding since I was just a first year student not really knowing exactly what I was doing with music therapy and feeling like wow okay how would you know where to start um I think I just was trained from the people who were telling me about what they were doing in music therapy, um, other students and other professors saying, you know, what really works for this population is songs that they probably would have recognized from when they were younger. Um, uh -huh. So sort of, yeah, accessing that emotional memory. Yeah. Uh -huh. So when I get, <laughs> that's funny, I just thought, when I get to be 64, been there, done that, <laughs> uh, I would probably respond to When I'm 64 by the Beatles. Right. Because <laughs> that was the music when I was a teenager. Absolutely. And it's challenging sometimes, especially with cultural differences, but they say even if you get music that they've never heard before in their life, as long as it's performed in a way that, you know, it just, it accesses emotion. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it matters, but it doesn't, doesn't disqualify it if it isn't music they would have they haven't heard before. So I wonder when you say that it's the same part of the brain which stores music and emotional memory. Mm -hmm. That's why like lovers have their song. Right. And 50 years later when you hear a certain song you'll remember who you were with when you I mean you're not old enough to know that yet. <laughs> <laughs> but for you maybe 10 years right, you'll right. remember the song that yeah. you heard with a certain person. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is and and I, you know, and I still have you know, jingles in my head from when I was 8 years old. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I can't remember somebody's name who I met yesterday, but I remember jingles. Right, right. We have a different way of storing lyrics in our mind too than, you know, random strings of words because we have so many other markers for remembering. There's a tone, there's a rhythm, you know, there's so many different qualities that make it so that we're, we can be jolted back into remembering a full song, you know. Wow. Yeah. What's going to be your song when you're <laughs> <laughs> losing oh, it? Oh, <laughs> probably uh, Call Me Al. <laughs> Call Me Al. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By Paul Simon. Yep. <laughs> uh, that, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me another story. I like that. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. So I, I have a client right now who's six years old. Um, first came to me with full-fledged OCD kind of symptoms, you know, like the what? counting and mm. the needing to um, do certain rituals in order to feel clean enough to get dressed and to leave the house. and. Um, it was causing him to start to lose days at school because he was, had so much anxiety about leaving the house. And this went from pretty much no symptoms to full-fledged these, these kind of symptoms. So it was very out In of blue. In a very blue. short time. Right. And according to the parents, very out of the blue. There was no real sort of signs for why this would happen, except for maybe some history in the family of similar kind of behaviors, but not at this extreme. Mm -hmm. So they're thinking maybe it was just organic? Um, yeah, they were like, well, he's, he's in first grade now. He does really well in school. And he, oh. like, every part of his life is pretty much doing really, really well. And just for some reason, all, all these symptoms started coming up. And, um, you know, the best explanation I could give them is, like, 
oh, maybe there's a genetic factor, but also, you know, it's really stressful being a first grader these days. Uh -huh. um, so maybe that had something to do with it, just the expectation to, you know, pass tests at first grade and uh -huh. to um, study spelling words and things like that that we didn't have to do back when we were in first grade yet, uh -huh. necessarily, at least not to that level. Um, so anyway, when I started working with him, I, to be honest, I felt quite um, humbled because I, I hadn't really worked with any kids with OCD or any other people with OCD before. But OCD, just to interject. Uh, yeah, obsessive, obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah. Yep. And so, but, you know, from my education and everything, I thought, okay, well, I'll just give it a try and what I know from what has worked with kids. Yeah. Um, and what has worked for OCD is traditionally something that not all kids want to do, which is cognitive behavioral therapy is like at its purest form, not necessarily fun. Um, uh -huh. So using music therapy was a fun way to get to doing sort of exposure therapy or, expo or cognitive behavioral therapy strategies. So he could be relaxed and I could be relaxed in, you know, getting him to feel like he can express himself, his anxieties and things like that. And now this is less than a year later. It'll be a year in April. And he has absolutely no symptoms. He's... So what, I mean, but how did you use music? So I always start with a hello song in the beginning. That's like, I guess, a ritual as well for my, my kids. How does it go? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm I'll put you trying on the spot. to, yeah, I'm trying to, I was easier if I had my guitar in my hand, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very simple. It's just like, hello, hello. Yeah, I can't even remember on the spot. But anyway, <laughs> it's just basically like saying hello, saying, how are you feeling today? And they get to, space to say how they're feeling today, I say how I feel today, and then we say our names, and that's pretty much it. And then, but it sort of sets the tone, right? Uh -huh. So if they said, you know, today I feel really sad and angry, you know, then I thought, oh, okay, let's, you know, let's talk about that, or let's do some kind of art project around that. So I really incorporate as many ah, arts as I can. so not just music. Yeah, yeah, I art incorporate. Project, like what? Like, um, you know, I'll say, oh, what did you feel sad about or whatever, and um, maybe we'll draw a picture about that, you know, and, and um, maybe we'll do a picture. He likes to do a lot of superheroes, uh -huh. so maybe it'll, and I'll, so I'll turn it towards, okay, like if his name was Timmy or something, mm -hmm. like, okay, let's dr draw, like, super Timmy, like, this, the most strong and, like, brave to me there is and cool. you know talk about yeah talk about feelings in that way you know uh -huh. yeah so that he could replace the scared Timmy with the brave Timmy right yeah. and and that having feelings is sometimes really brave uh-huh yeah so wow <laughs> so do you do therapy in your job that besides the uh, expressive arts, like just regular talk therapy? Um, yeah, I, I use, use more talk therapy than anything else because most of my clients come into the clinic not knowing that I use expressive arts. Uh -huh. And they'll be curious and interested. But to be honest, I think a lot of people come in and they're in a much, such a high level of, of need to talk. Uh -huh. that I find that talking is more supportive at points than, than using the arts um, for, th for these specific individuals. Um, because as you probably know, even though people coming to mental health counselors should be somehow not in the highest of needs, they often are maybe just to the brink of needing to go to the hospital or something like uh -huh. that. Yeah. And so you're sort of there to help as preventative care to that and and maybe helpful in terms of finding more social work kind of resources and um, yeah trying to work with them that yeah, way. Yeah I mean because usually don't you find that by the time they get themselves to make the appointment and to come yeah. in things have gotten I mean it's not like they just thought of it they've probably been thinking of it for months. Yeah or years. Or yeah. years. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I, I just got a client who's, uh, I think he's in first, second grade, and you know, I said, oh, when did these problems start? Oh, since he was pretty much an infant. I'm like, oh, okay, so you didn't think about bringing them to the therapist before? Oh, no, no, I didn't think about it. So, oh, yeah. yeah, and that's just a six-year-old, so, yeah. Time for us to take a break. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more, more, more from <laughs> Marissa Miley Katz. <laughs> You're watching ThinkTech Hawaii, Hawaii's leading digital media platform for civic engagement, raising public awareness on tech, energy, diversification, and globalism. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Welcome back to Shrink Wrap Hawaii with my guest Marissa Miley Katz. And Marissa was just telling us about various ways that she uses music therapy in her practice. And how else? What else? Tell me some others. Yeah, sure. Um, so I have. Uh, some clients who are more wanting to take the lead and that could be a sign of feeling like things are f rather out of control in mm. the rest of their world um, and so feeling like they have a space to really take the lead and and make their own symphony in the room you know so uh, a symphony meaning uh, metaphor because we don't have a bunch of <laughs> instruments in the room like that but we do have many different kinds of instruments and sometimes I, I have clients that will say, okay, today we're going to have different stations with different instruments, and each instrument is going to represent um, a different word in the song. And so I'll go through a song on the guitar and singing, and every time they get to a part, they have to run over and do the instruments in that station. And oh, fun. Yeah, and so, but this is all created by them, right? So this is all sort of inspired by the playfulness of the space. Um, and I think that's really what the kind of music therapy that I'm using most of the time is just sort of trying to get people to tap into a sense of play so that they can um, get to these sort of therapeutic moments. There's a lot of ideas about how when we can get into the zone, right, we can have these sort of cathartic experiences. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, that's the idea, t too, when, when kids are able to even lead it themselves and they can create those own, their own experiences like that, and I get to be witness to that. Wow. So, interested me that you said, you know, you, you create this kind of play, playful atmosphere. Yeah. How do you do that? I don't feel like <laughs> my counseling is very playful. <laughs> um, well, I, I think starts with just coming to the beginning of, okay, what, what do you specialize in? Well, I do music therapy. Oh, what's music therapy? Well, we use music in a way to get to therapeutic goals, and, and this is an example of that. You know, I'll say we can sing this song or we can write this song, and they go, oh, I can't do that. I don't know, I don't know how to do anything with music. I can't sing. I don't know how to write any poetry or anything. I say it's okay, you know. Let's just pretend, or we'll just, we'll just, um, we'll just be the worst musicians we can be. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, I'll make it like I'll just say, you know, just humor me. Yeah. And I feel like that's what a lot of different modalities of therapy have to do. Just be like, I know this feels weird, but just give it a shot, see how it feels, and and then before you know it, a lot of times people are relaxed and they're and they're in that zone and they get it after wow. they experience it. Yeah. So, how long have you been doing this now? I've only <laughs> been doing this probably four years now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So. I mean, 
It must be surprising what happens all the time. Yeah, there's a lot of surprising moments. Yeah, <laughs> there definitely is. Yeah. Scary sometimes? Um, it's been scary at times, sure. Um, sometimes when I've worked at Perkins School for the Blind mm. in um, Watertown, Massachusetts, there are some kids who really had difficulty with self-control because of disability, multiple disabilities and just emotional regulation in combination and not really having a sense of their, of their bodies and what they were capable of. And so being able to stay safe and also keep them safe was like sometimes a challenge, but... Were you doing music with the, the, the blind people there? Yeah, um, all the people I worked with there were, at, the population I worked with were adolescents with blindness, with mm -hmm. some blindness, and also with other disabilities. Uh -huh. um, and they were, it was interesting actually because a lot of times, a lot of what they wanted to do, the acting out kind of things, you know, tantruming, slamming things, you could use to your advantage with the instruments. You know, you could say like, drum it out, you know, use that drum on that cymbal and you know <laughs> go as hard as you want on it and then and that was like a great outlet for them luckily it was in a basement <laughs> where I am I can't do that right now I'd love to be able to do that but yeah so they could be as loud as they wanted Wanna to be, be yeah you can be as angry as they want to be on those drums and those cymbals and whatever instruments as long as they're not breaking the instruments right and then you just sort of use so you meet them where they're at emotionally and mm -hmm. then you just sort of use the other varying dynamics because after a while you're going to get bored of doing the same blah, 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 blah. so you like say okay let's try that this way and that way and bring it back up bring it back down mm. so you can experience emotion through various dynamics of music too you know you mentioned that that school perkins school is in watertown yep and um it makes me remember that you were in Watertown during the Boston Marathon. Yeah. And that must have been scary for you and for the people there. Yeah, it was um, on lockdown, and the school was on lockdown, and um, we just had to wait inside until that whole day until things were cleared up. Could you sing? <laughs> Could I sing? <laughs> I guess so. There was not a lot going on because it was spring break for the kids, but uh. yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you use it on for yourself? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I definitely. I, mean, I think that's how one of the reasons I first decided, okay, this is what I want to do. Um, just practicing in the practice rooms that in my music program in college for you know hours at a time, and I would feel like all different feelings coming in. Sometimes I wouldn't want to be there, and using the music, regardless of how I was feeling, to practice and by the time I was done feeling better however it was just like how people use exercise to feel better you know, so you would use singing yeah yeah I would use singing and it would sometimes that was yeah there was a way to vocalize whatever I was going through and then by the end of it I felt a lot more relaxed and centered in my thinking. Yeah, just I, I remember I took voice lessons for a short time and yeah. just singing scales. Maybe it's just using your breath. Yeah, I think so. It's very relaxing. I mean, just talking about it now, I feel more <laughs> relaxed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you still do that? Uh, I practice singing and stuff. Uh, well, use, yeah, singing. Yeah, I still use music to, yeah, to feel better about whatever is going on if, if, I, if I'm having a tough time. Yeah, I'm you definitely writing lyrics too yeah writing lyrics your own yeah. lyrics oh yeah 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 huh <laughs> so you're also you write songs yeah i don't know if i'll ever share them but yeah <laughs> do you use them in your practice yeah well i use that's how i got the hello song the goodbye you, song. You, you i made you, it up that as a music therapy student you have to you have to make your own hello and goodbye song and you're encouraged to make as many songs as you can if you feel like they would help people therapeutically, yeah. So I need a song, like, before I do the show <laughs> each week, I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can help me with a song. Yeah. Okay. How do I start? I don't know. I think, yeah, start with... The hello song? <laughs> yeah, sure. Whatever, whatever you feel like is going to 
like you said, meet your meet your anxiety where you're at, whatever. Oh, I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm really, really scared. There you go. It really yeah. is freaking me out. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't and matter you, if I sing badly. And then the second verse could be like, maybe it won't be so scary. <laughs> you know. <laughs> maybe it will. Maybe we'll have nothing to say. It'll be really bad. We'll have no thing to say. <laughs> But it'll all be okay. <laughs> but it'll all be okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. What's the worst that can happen? Right. 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 Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. So, what scares you the most? Oh my gosh. Um, I I think different things at different times, but I what scares me the most um, that I'll never be able to move back to Hawaii. I'd love to move back. Oh. <laughs> wow. What do you miss about Hawaii? Oh, I miss the weather for sure. I yeah, miss, it's cold in Boston now, yeah. I miss the people, and I miss the food. <laughs> yep. Maybe you can write a song about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of songs about that already, too. Yeah? <laughs> about missing Hawaii? Oh, yeah. 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 Is there a, a place? Do you have a special place? Oh, yeah. Kailua Beach. <laughs> that is your magic place? Kailua Beach is definitely the place I think of when I think, oh, I miss Hawaii. Yeah. Oh, what is it about the beach? The sunrise. Uh-huh. Yeah. Every morning it's different and beautiful in its own way. And, yep. Wow. <laughs> so would, if you could bring some of Boston to Kailua Beach, what would you bring? Or vice versa. Or vice versa. Um, I would bring really good gelato and ice cream to Hawaii <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see coffee maybe very good uh -huh. coffee I would probably bring a lot of universities with me uh -huh. and libraries yep <laughs> well I think we're running out of time so I wanted to thank you Marissa for being on the show today thank you for and, having me uh, again maybe we could think of a goodbye song which they could take out right yeah. like they could just Bring us out with a little music. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. 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 <laughs>